bats are the first flying creatures we encounter in Shining Force 3. They are not affected by terrain conditions and can travel across otherwise impassable obstacles such as water or lava. Although lacking the durability of the masked monks, the bat is capable of similar damage and has a chance to use a poison special attack, which damages the victim's health every turn until cured. Bats, along with many other flying creatures, are inherently vulnerable to the weapons of archers such as shortbows, longbows and crossbows. This second type of Mask Monk possesses basic magic powers and far higher HP than his lesser brethren. Able to cast Tornado 1, a weak attack spell, he can throw his targets into the air to deal damage. While he does possess higher hit points than the Mask Monks we've seen before, his attack and defense characteristics are lower, making him something of a sitting duck when his limited mana pool is exhausted. His weapon is an Ankh, and as such, he does not share the same vulnerability to our forces knights as his lesser brethren. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Let's Play Shining Force 3. This is Battle 2 on the Sauerbahn Bridge. My name is Total Biscuit, and this is a little bit more of a complex fight, as you can clearly see. And the most complex element of this fight is this barrel, our biggest enemy, our worst foe. Our nemesis. This particular battle actually blocks off the entrance to that ship over there. If you don't destroy it in this battle, you will never be able to get onto that ship, and that ship contains a very nifty item hidden away in a treasure chest. So we're going to be taking that out a little bit later on. What you'll also note is that there are actually two friendly NPCs in this battle, Garrosh and Hayward, and they are part of the first Sync Point event, the Synchronicity System, something I mentioned in the introduction to Shining Force 3, and I'll be providing you with a more in-depth tutorial as to what's actually going to happen a little bit later on in this video. For the time being, we have a very narrow battlefield with quite a few choke points, which is nicer than before, although most of the choke points tend to be mitigated by the fact that we have several flying enemies in the form of bats, which you can see at either side. Now, Avoiding contact with those bats is quite tricky. It is possible, but it seems to be dependent entirely on how the computer AI is actually feeling that particular day. So we're going to try and stick to the middle of the bridge to avoid them, although I have the feeling that that's probably not going to work out too well. Never mind, it doesn't really matter. We're going to have to engage them one way or the other at some point during this fight, so I'm not particularly concerned. They're not massively dangerous they just happen to be rather annoying and you really can't keep them away from your healers because they can travel across almost any terrain so got a little bit of a plot element here you'll actually notice that sometimes there are plot elements woven into the battles it's not a straight cut between plot scenes and battles there's actually a little bit of intermingling there which is quite nice it does help the story along a bit now we're going to come up to our first sync point so i'm going to let you watch this short educational presentation Sync points are places in the game in which the result of various battles and events directly affects what occurs on the next scenario disc. Largely irrelevant to those who only played scenario 1, this system is a significant innovation. Sync points range from simple tasks like discovering a hidden character or area to saving the lives of particular NPCs in battle. In this case, we are faced with two Saraban bridge guards who somehow survived the massacre perpetrated by the masked monks on their way out of Saraband with the kidnapped emperor. They act as NPCs until spoken to by one of the Force's characters, an action which takes that character's turn and requires him or her to be standing next to the NPC. Garrosh, if spoken to before he is killed, will be able to escape the battlefield and will show up in Scenario 2 and join your party. If he is allowed to die, his brother Jade will appear instead. If Hayward survives the battle, he will join the Force as our first capable archer. If he is killed at any point in this battle, regardless of whether or not the player has actually spoken to him, he will be gone for good. And there you have it, a brief explanation of the synchronicity system and how it applies to this particular battle. Now, Garrosh is going to go down to very low HP here, but we're not going to let him die because we want the best possible result. Now, when I say the best possible result, I'm talking from a plot perspective. From a gameplay perspective, it's actually more of a grey area. If you don't get Garrosh, you will get Jade, his brother, who is a tank gunner in an entirely different class, although they do fulfil relatively similar roles. Some people prefer Jade, some people don't. In this case, I'm a bit of a goody two-shoes, so I'm going to be keeping Garrosh alive. Now, I could have just talked to him there, and it would have said, him straight off the battlefield and saved him. However, I would like to demonstrate the rather questionable nature of the friendly NPC AI when we see a crop up. And you're going to see why I let him survive a little bit later, because they have a tendency to do some incredibly stupid things. Now, time to kill all this bat outright, which as you're about to see gains an exceptionally large amount of experience and will gain Masker in a level. Very helpful, it's about time that she got one. 
Now, there are benefits to getting straight out kills with one character, but there are also benefits to sharing the kills, sharing the glory and using multiple characters to kill a specific enemy because it actually gains friendship rating. I'm going to see a little bit of that later on and you'll get a more in-depth explanation in a future video. Now, special attacks. Here's a special attack. It's a poison attack and not entirely surprisingly it poisons. And that was explained briefly in the best Jerry section. Now, special attacks, whether they be enemy or friendly, are based on a proc chance and in the case of our characters, they can be learned via gaining weapon proficiency. Now, weapon proficiency is far less complex than it sounds. You use a weapon, you gain proficiency in it. And now, it doesn't matter if you attack with it or cast a spell while wielding it, you're still gaining proficiency. And as you go through the levels of proficiency, not only do you gain special attacks, but you also gain bonus attack and magic power, which is very useful. And it gets a little bit more complex than that, but we'll explain it more in depth in a future video. We just acquired Hayward there, and we are going to see Garrosh in action as he takes on the clear and present danger of the barrel. Thank you, friendly NPC AI. Very good. I think it's probably about time that we got Garrosh off of the battlefield there. We're going to do so by talking to him. So that's the sync point fulfilled. Garrosh will appear in scenario two and is going to go talk on our behalf to the governor of Saraban. Whether or not that's going to make a difference, well, we'll see that a little bit later on. Now, Speaking of AI, this is a good demonstration of AI. Now, in the thread, some people said, well, oh, the AI seems to have too much of a tendency to go after the leader. Not so much, as you've just clearly seen. I've let you see one of my characters die. The reason being that that was a weak healer character standing directly behind the leader, and the AI walked straight past the leader and killed the weaker healer character. So it's not as dumb as you might think. It is a little bit scatterbrained at times, but in this case, it made a good decision. It killed one of my characters. We're not, of course, going to be allowing it to do that very often, but it's nice to demonstrate that the AI is not entirely thick-headed. Now, this is the boss character, who I like to call the Ankh Monk. He's just another variant of the Mask Monk. He wields an Ankh, and he has basic magic power. He's got a lot more HP than his brethren, as you can see. He's got 38 HP, but his defense is lower, so we're dealing a lot more damage to him. He is the boss character, and killing him will actually end the level. We could have done it earlier, but there really is no point. Not only because we're trying to gain XP for our characters, but because he's not a threat. He tends to stay rooted to the position that he started in, and he has a lower movement rate than the rest of the characters. What what he can do, however, is he can cast this spell, which is Tornado. It's a very basic spell. It can go through four iterations of power and in levels two and three actually gains an AoE effect. So it's not the worst spell ever. It's very mana efficient, but it doesn't do an awful lot of damage. It's not particularly threatening. We will see it an awful lot later on. Indeed, one of our characters will be able to gain it later on. So I'm going to use Masquerin to heal up Kite just because Masquerin has no mana left and there's no point. You'll see there Kite now views Masquerin as a partner. That's something we're going to be explaining more later on. It's the friendship system in action and you'll get to see that in Battle 3 as we show the bonuses. So we've taken out the boss. It's all done. It's all over. And not a particularly difficult fight by any stretch. It's a fight that I prefer to do, not only because it has multiple challenging elements within it, but because it's got some nice choke points. My name has been Total Biscuit. This has been Battle 2 on the Saraband Bridge. This is Let's Play Shining Force 3. I will see you back in the thread. This is Total Biscuit, signing off.